this project was about moving super loads and these were um, it depends on who you ask and it depends on how many trailers or, or, or tractors you add in but somewhere around 430 tons uh, uh, and above uh, this project emerged from um, a government initiative in Victoria, uh, the state um, uh, that Melbourne's based in, uh, to remove level crossing removals. Uh, uh, sorry, to remove level crossings. So there's a lot of uh, metro trains running through Melbourne and they share the, the road surface uh, with uh, vehicular traffic and pedestrians and cyclists and there's a lot of fatalities as a result of that. Uh, and so uh, the government uh, committed uh, as it was elected to getting rid of I think it was 55 level crossings across Melbourne and it's not straightforward so this is one of the level crossings that uh, was to be removed and you can see the site constraints uh, that you have here you've got buildings around it uh, obviously you've got live traffic live trains how do you uh, remove that level crossing do you go under or do you go over so in some cases they went under, uh, the train line now goes under the road, in other cases the train line goes up and over. This was an up and over and initially it was to be a more traditional type of bridge deck uh, made of uh, what are called super T beams which are just precast, uh, pre-stressed concrete beams. Uh, but when it went to public consultation the train is sitting on top of these beams and so you have the structural depth plus the train depth and it was too deep in terms of the visual uh, impact on uh, the community around. So the choice was made then to try and drop the train inside the structural depth. So you end up with something that's U-shaped uh, to try and carry uh, the, the train. So, the, uh, so a single line sits inside this U-trough. Um, so now we have the kind of the structural shape. Uh, and why did we need to move these things? Why didn't we just build these things uh, in situ? Uh, well, the reason for that is because you are, we only had a 60-day possession uh, of the rail line. So in 60 days, the trains were live, uh, and then uh, bus replacements, because we're talking about a lot of people, tens of thousands of people every day, um, and 60 days to getting the bridge uh, constructed, and the rail line, new rail line over the bridge commissioned and in op operation for 60 days. So it's a huge uh, amount of pressure, and so of course this means you have to prefabricate these uh, u troughs and bring them to the site. Uh, and so these beams are 31 meters long, uh, 12 um, made up each 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 line, uh, each each rail line. So it's 24 in total, and the beams themselves weigh 270 tons. So they were fabricated about 70 kilometers north of Melbourne in a very large precast yard, uh, and then transported down. And that's where we come in. We come in on those transporting uh, transporting these down because they're so big. And this is the uh, transport arrangement for uh, these beams. And, uh, you know, kind of a, a picture to give you a sense of the scale of it. This is a three lane highway. So, you know, it's, it's big. It's really big. Um, we get this kind of loading chart. And this is the, uh, I suppose, an elevation of it, 72 meters long. And this is only with, uh, with two tractors, right? Um, the first night we started running it, we realized two tractors were not enough because it was a hill and the two tractors couldn't get it up the hill. So that was the first night's work over and done with in the space of about an hour. Never got to our bridge on the first night. Uh, we ended up with five tractors to actually get this thing going. So the total length of it ended up at over 100 meters, I think. Um, so it's, it's a huge operation and it had two, um, I think it was 12 axle uh, platforms to, to, to carry it uh, down. Um, uh, down, down the road and so on. Uh, so that's what uh, we were m involved in moving. Um, except, of course, we were brought in right at the end because it got to the point where all of this was in place, and then somebody said, "Well, now it's got you know the bridge beams have to cross bridges." Um, the state road authority, Vic Roads, um, said, "Well, you know, okay, we'll do an assessment," and they realised that there were six bridges on this route that were utterly critical. Um, they had a look at lots of different routes, uh, but this route, for geometry, for road furniture purposes, uh, obviously direct access as well, or, or uh, the most direct route, uh, this was the route that made most sense. So these bridges, these six bridges, became an issue. And the decision was made that structural health monitoring on these bridges was required. Um, I heard about that around Paddy's Day uh, last year. 
and it was just kind of whispers in the wind a little bit, you know, because I, I try and talk to these people all the time because they're, they're who we need to talk to. Uh, and then eventually it got to a point where we got a first meeting, 28th of March, 29th of March, we got a formal go ahead, right, straight away. And I said, great, yeah, no problem. So when's the first move, you know, thinking six months away? Um, no, it was the 6th of April. We had about, uh, I think it was 11 days or something. So our 9th of April was the plan for first move. So, you know, our, uh, our strategy was to panic. And, uh, and it worked out. Uh, we, did, we did lots of panic. And Easter fell right in the middle, and that just caused chaos because, of course, everything was closed and we couldn't source equipment, instrumentation. Um, but other factors came into play and things got delayed a little bit. So it wasn't until the 20th of April that the first movement happened. So all of the engineering that you're going to see in a few minutes happened in the space of uh, about two weeks. Um, because we were trying to aim for this uh, plan first move. The installation took a bit longer uh, than, than initially thought. We had a couple of days of baseline readings, which is just regular traffic, so that we can begin to see does the instrumentation make sense. And it ended up being only 20 moves, not 24, because uh, for the beams, uh, the, the difficulty uh, in, in the movements wasn't anticipated. It was much more difficult than uh, people thought. And so the last four beams were actually moved as L sections, eight L sections, uh, which were far lighter and easier to move. So the requirements we were given, a very tight timeline. That's the key thing here. All the solutions you're going to see, um, there's, there's probably a better solution. Um, but given the tight time constraints that we were under, um, that's the lens you need to view our solutions through. Pick roads require deflections to be measured, which is a little unusual. We don't really like to measure deflections. Deflections aren't a great measure of what's going on with a structure because it's, it's essentially it's a double integration of strain. Um, uh, you know, it, it's a very uh, coarse measurement of structural behavior. Um, but that's what they wanted. Um, the reason it turns out that they wanted that is they didn't have structural models of the bridges and they had span on 250 as their limit. They said, if the bridge exceeds span on 250, we're worried. It was a bit rough and ready, but um, we were okay with that, you know. So they wanted deflections, they wanted up to 12 points per structure, and they wanted each point monitored at about 10 hertz. The reason for the 10 hertz, the 10 times a second recording of the deflections, uh, was actually to kill off, um, because the contractor suggested they would use total stations. Um, and it takes about 20 seconds to traverse a total station from point to point. And the problem with that, of course, is the load is already gone, right, by the time you've got to your 12th point. Um, so they wanted to kill off the suggestion of uh, surveying, standard surveying approaches as being what would be used here. So they came up with this 10 hertz sampling rate. And it makes sense actually, because you, you want to have some confidence, you want to be able to um, smooth your data and so on. So um, Because the movements were for you know six weeks, it wasn't one night. It, if it's one night, it's not a big problem. You just close the road, set up the platform, and measure you know, with, a, with an LVDT directly under. We couldn't do that because we're talking about six weeks. We can't close these roads for six weeks. Some of these are the busiest roads in Melbourne, a city of five million people. So you just couldn't close it. So we had to keep, uh, our solutions had to uh, not obstruct the traffic, right? Uh, and then we have other things like vandalism, we had no power. Uh, a lot of times we had difficult access. You'll see some photos as well. And uh, our, I guess our site extended for about 75 kilometers as well up and down this road. So in the space of five weeks, I think I did 10,000 kilometers in my youth trying to get up and down to, uh, to all these bridges. So we, you know, a huge kind of complexity of uh, constraints on the project. So the casting yard was up uh, near Kilmore. Um, so maybe you know Melbourne. Uh, this is where the site was in Frankston. The casting yard Kilmore is up here. Um, you know, the map, the scale of the map is hard to appreciate a bit, but uh, we had two bridges um, in near Kilmore, and then we kind of 30, 40 kilometers down the road before we had this one bridge on its own, and then we had the three urban bridges uh, called Kempston, Banksy, and Middleburg Bridge. Uh, so they were the six bridges um, that we needed to monitor uh, with those constraints. So I'll go through each bridge. Um, each of the bridges is different, and each of them had a kind of a different solution, but some of the solutions, of course, are quite similar to each other. Um, so the first is Kilmore Bridge, and uh, Kilmore Bridge is a, it's a small rural uh, road. Um, it was widened in the 30s. It had, I think the first part of it was 1910, so we've got these RSJs with uh, 
uh, comes a concrete deck on it. It's a short span, you know, 7.4 meters uh, span, quite tall. Um, so that means, you know, ladders and things immediately become uh, not safe. Uh, you know, health and safety, of course, is a huge uh, parameter on all of our works. So we had scaffolding set up and then we could just about reach the mid span on these. Um, this is a cross section through the bridge. Uh, these sketches that are throughout the, uh, the presentation were done in the space of two hours, one afternoon. Uh, and I, this was, I was just kind of thinking it through and how are we going to do this and what does it look like? And then I sent them to somebody and of course, next thing you go out on site and there's like 50 builders with your sketches. I'm like, oh, I didn't really mean them for, because you can see they're not very neat. So I didn't really mean them for everybody to see, but uh, yeah, so kind of when, when things are, when timelines are so compressed, uh, careful what you put to paper I guess. Um, so this was uh, the cross section through the bridge and normally on these kind of heavy loads um, everybody is used to running down the center line um, of the bridge because that way you get best load share across the full width of the bridge deck. But on this one because it had been widened um, we had this joint here and we didn't know how this joint had been dowelled or not so we weren't sure you know, are you going to get good load share across uh, that joint or not in the bridge? So I suggested that we, we don't travel center line running. Instead, we travel center line on the widened section, which we think was uh, a little bit better. Um, so this was uh, an unusual arrangement. Of course, it meant we had to get the truck drivers to, to drive off center, which they weren't used to. So the solution on this one was to use strain transducers, um, top and bottom flange on the steel sections and uh, I'll explain why because again remember we were asked for deflections. So the idea was that we would convert the strains into curvature because the slope of the strain diagram is curvature and curvature then can be double integrated to, to give you deflection. So it's approximate but it was fine in this case because the integration form, the link between deflection and curvature, this assumes um, a uniformly distributed load but the platform itself is on a seven meter, over a seven meter bridge length is uniformly distributed, right? Uh, and so, you know, it's a pretty good uh, approximation uh, of, um, of a UDL. So everybody was kind of happy that measuring the top and bottom strain uh, would give us the slope of our strain diagram, tell us where the neutral axis is and also tell us the maximum tensile strain that'd be in the section. So we were giving them deflections, but we weren't measuring deflections. Um, and uh, of course measuring strains is a much better measure uh, for structural response. How do we do that? What equipment did we have? We used, um, these are HBM strain transducers, they're great, they're reusable. Um, it's a full bridge strain gauge inside in the section and then you uh, bolt it on or we used uh, steel screws uh, to put them into the bottom flange. Um, connected into, this is a data translation, um, is, is a system from, I think it's the US, and, and they're really good. They can read at uh, 100 kilohertz, right? Strain sampling really, really fast. Uh, and they come with their own software and, and that's what we use uh, to, to extract it. So that worked pretty neat. And these are USB, so um, really easy to work with those two units. So this is an example then of, of what the readings look like. Um, so we have raw data from one beam, for example. So strain top and bottom. Uh, and of course the strain uh, on the top flange is close to zero and that makes sense because that's close to where the neutral axis is and then the strain near the bottom flange of course is a lot bigger and by working out the slope of the strain diagram applying our, our formula that you saw we can estimate then the deflection uh, in all three beams we have the six strain gauges or the strain transducers so we have the deflection then that uh, in in the uh, in the middle beam, which is the most heavily loaded beam, of course, and we can see the symmetry. Um, is the load running where we want the load to run as well um, uh, from the measurements on B4 and B2? And you know you can see on this example that it, it was it was pretty well uh, running where we wanted it to run. Um, so we can you know the strain measurements we can see the tractors quite clearly. We can see the gap in the platforms and we can see individual axles as well which is the basis of uh, bridgeway in motion as well, if you're familiar with bridgeway in motion technology. Uh, some issues on the monitoring, which, um, you know, if you're gonna do this yourself, um, the, one of these learning curves you go through uh, when, when this comes up. The first one, it was quite interesting. It didn't return to zero, and this got everybody really worried because, oh my God, our bridge has yielded, right? And this was, and you're, you know, we're looking at them, we're saying, well, it doesn't look, everything looks fine. There's no signs of distress, there's no, cracking or spalling or so we, we, we 
you know, we, in consultation with Vic Rose, we said, look, we, we think it's okay. So we went ahead and we did the second move then, um, and then we get the, the orange curve there. And we still get a, a non-zero return, except this time's better. And you can see the extra tractor here, by the way, in, in the strain readings. Uh, and it was interesting, it was coming less to zero, and then the third move, by the time we got the third move, we got perfect return to zero. And so, thinking about this a little bit more, and the way that the strain transducers were steel screwed into the flanges, we, we think that there was a ratcheting that was happening, and the steel screws were kind of bedding into the steel a little bit. And of course, if you really strain it, and then it tries to return, it, it, it's leaving some pre-strain in the strain transducer. And that's why we were getting this non-return to zero. And so we figured that this kind of is, is a phenomenon that we should see in these kind of uh, connections uh, in future. So I'm going to be looking out for it. Um, that over time, this residual offset will reduce back down to zero. And um, after the third movement, we never saw it again. So they certainly bed in. Uh, of course, the issue with a lot of these super loads is you don't get 20 chances to see if it beds in or not. You usually just get one go on a super load. And that's why this project was uh, kind of so unique as well. Uh, so that's what this site looked like. Um, I had lots of time to play with some photography through the project as well. My students were busy at the computer screen and the load going mm -hmm. past. And, uh, so it was good fun. Um, so the second bridge down, which is quite close to that bridge we just saw, is the arch bridge, um, which is a bluestone granite arch. And it's uh, heritage listed, so we weren't supposed to do much damage to it at all. In fact, we were supposed to do none, but a few holes appeared in it uh, over time. But uh, it, sh it should be fine. It's only a small span, three meters, but of course, um, they were quite worried about the spandrel walls uh, and the barrel shape here. Um, you know, we know, we know, especially Irish uh, experience, we know arches are incredibly strong and our structural models don't really work very well for arches. Um, but at the same point, when you don't know what's going on, you don't know the mortar joints, you don't know what the backfill is, um, there's, a, there's a concern there. So uh, the, the spandrel walls uh, on the side, um, it was, Vic Rose were happy that um, post move surveying would be sufficient to see if those spandrel walls were moving after the load crossed, but the barrel shape was something they were concerned about in real time, um, you know, to make sure it was no collapse. Uh, so this was the arrangement, um, so this was center line running of course, um, because we have perfect symmetry on the bridge, uh, and they said they wanted three planes monitored, um, they wanted the center plane and then two uh, outside planes monitored, uh, and of course we said well let's put those other ones underneath the wheel path. Um, so this is roughly the layout, and uh, it was tricky because uh, you saw the water underneath the arch and so we're trying to measure the spread of the arch but we you know we can't put our sensors in the water right so how do we how do we do this um, well there's a sensor type called a string potentiometer which is a it's um, it's a, a pot there's a picture in the next slide but uh, uh, with a string that comes out of it and I said well what we can do is we can try and put all our sensors up high but then we take our strings down low into where the floodwaters might be because of course it might rain right so what the the problem of putting the sensors up high is is now it's not a uh, um, an absolute measure of movement it's a relative measure of movement because I'm measuring from one corner of the arch down to the other corner of the arch and of course the, the movement I'm measuring is just a differential movement it's not an absolute movement right and we needed to know the absolute so we ended up with this arrangement where uh, in the center of the um, in the center of the of the arch um, I, I, we fix a, a, a stake in the ground and then we measure directly off the stake in the ground which is now our reference measurement up to the crown of the arch and then from the crown of the arch we'll measure down to a point um, a, a little bit down uh, and we'll have a ring there and then we'll measure across the two springing points on the arch from there. So the first, the red line tells us the movement of the crown and then the green line tells us the chain, the movement of the springing with reference to the crown uh, and then of course the quarter points on the arch or the third points are then measured off that springing as well. So with some geometry, as you can see down here, we were able to figure it out and then uh, you, you know you, you turn a trigonometric problem into what's it going to be what's it going to look like when it's built and, and this is what we have so we had a stake um, with the wire up to the crown two sensors at the crown 
Um, the, the second one coming down to a ring here and then the, uh, the nichrome wire which is a very very stiff, it's like a fishing line but it's extremely stiff. The nichrome wire is going to the two springing points and then the two springing points going back uh, to the uh, third points on the arch as well. So with this arrangement we're actually able to look at the change in shape of the arch uh, during the traverse uh, of the load. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, after we have, so we, we've uh, two string pots um, here and then this is the third point and then it all goes down to the springing and we're able to, to look at the changing shape of the arch uh, in real time, 10 hertz. <laughs> so this is what the string pot looks like and this is string and you pull it out and then you can extend it quite easily with that micron wire I mentioned uh, and a lot of um, four core wiring then of course, so we'll go back to this, you can see the wiring uh, along here taking it all back to our data acquisition system. Um, we had a lot of problems with this bridge uh, in terms of electrical noise. We tried a lot of different stuff, including like sound engineering, uh, AC line filters to try and get very clear, you know, 240 sinusoid volts. And, um, but it, it's still, the results were still a little bit noisy and this is the kind of results that we were getting. Um, and of course everybody was a bit concerned because sometimes there's a jump, other times it just looks like noise. And, uh, we, had, we had voltage and current based sensors because that's all we could find in Australia um, at the short notice that we had. Um, but from lots of these movements we were able to put together a picture of how the arch was behaving uh, over time. And of course, you know, we convert those measurements which don't make a lot of sense on their own with the trigonometry and uh, we're able to... Um, so this is what it kind of looks like then. When we plot all 20 movements on top of each other, uh, and have a look at how the arch is, is behaving uh, in those movements, we're beginning to see this kind of consistent performance in the arch in spite of the fact that the measurements weren't all perfectly neat and everything. And you know, it makes sense. Um, we get a lot more movement in the, in the mid plane um, than the, uh, the two outside planes, that makes sense. Um, it's interesting that we're getting this kind of uh, movement on the west plane uh, and it, it, it's obviously just some, something in the arch it's not perfectly symmetrical, it's, it has characteristics. It, you know, maybe the mortar joint is a little bit um, washed out or something over on this side. Um, but the movements that we had, um, everybody was kind of happy with them. Uh, they were very, very small. Um, because of the problems, we, uh, we wanted to just do a sense check. So we did you know, high, high resolution video recording during the traverses and just you know, not, not assuming the numbers we're seeing on the computer screen are correct. Uh, trying completely independent systems to just make sure that uh, we are seeing very small movements when it's saying. Uh, so this is uh, what, what the site looks like. We had a little bit of scaffolding to work off and we had all our sensors in here. Uh, we had our use on our, um, our table with the, the laptop screen uh, outside of there. Um, so now we're moving a bit further down. This is now about 30 kilometers south of uh, where uh, the last two bridges were and of course we needed different teams at each bridge because the load, we can't pass the load, it's so big, right? So uh, you, you need your team already at the bridge before the load gets there. Um, and of course these movements would start at about, you know, 8 or 9 p.m. at night and depending on if the load got held up, you might be 3 a.m. by the time it gets to, to this bridge. So this is, um, Finden Creek is, is a U-slab bridge. Uh, it's a reinforced concrete um, inverted U uh, is, is the shape and Victoria has lots of these because they were easy to, to make and they were easy to erect and construct and they are from uh, the 60s, the late 50s and the early 60s. They have um, a shear key um, in here and the shear key gets washed out, really common problem with these types of bridges and as a result of that the bridge doesn't load share across the width of the deck very well. And this is a real problem, of course, because if you're not able to share load across it, you're carrying all your load in one or two use labs, and then you can have failures. Uh, so they didn't know uh, if they had this uh, load sharing problem. They also didn't know if they had a reinforced concrete overlay slab on top of it. The drawings and you know the history of this bridge was lost through time. Uh, so it, this bridge was a real concern. As it turned out, it was fine. We had the, it had an overlay slab on it, probably about 300 mil of solid concrete, and that just shared the load across all the use labs, whether or not they had a shear key problem. We were asked to monitor three beams, uh, and so in, in my uh, section there, you can see the, the LVDTs that are here, and I'll talk a little bit more about how uh, we measured that. So we use something called uh, a tension wire system. And uh, this came about from uh, 
paper by Hani Nassif and um, you know, we saw the photos in, in the paper and I said, great, I'm going to use that system. That looks, that looks really, really cool for what we need. Um, and of course, in the paper, typical with journal papers, they don't tell you all the problems that they had. They just tell you it works and it's beautiful. And of course, we discovered all these problems and I spoke to him afterwards. He said, oh yeah, we knew all that, you know, so, oh, we could have written about it. Uh, I might use it. But anyway, the idea of this is you, uh, you tension a wire between the two abutments and pull it really tight and that's your benchmark. And then you just measure the deflection, you, you put an LVDT or some sort of measurement uh, you know, sensor on your beam, and then as your beam deflects relative to the tension wire, you measure your deflection. So you don't need a platform, you don't need a beam, you, you, know, you, you, have, a, you have an unobstructed um, water course underneath, um, and so the, the, the tension line gives you that benchmark to measure off. I'll go into that a little bit more. This was only seven meters, so the tension line on this was super easy to do. Uh, you'll see another bridge a bit later where it wasn't so straightforward. The equipment for it then, this is a kind of a blow up section of it. Um, we somehow, you know, I just said packing with epoxy bonding, that was my job done I thought, but uh, it, it, it changed, it turned out a bit different, I'll show you photos a little bit later. Uh, the LVDT then would come down onto the tension line uh, and, and measure. And at this point I'll show you, um, this is one of our blocks, and uh, so we have a, a little threaded hole here on the block and the, the thread then uh, screws onto the bottom of the, um, these are linear potentiometers actually, LVDT is a diff slightly different, but uh, so you screw that on and I said perfect, I don't even see there's a little U in there and I said great, that'll sit over the wire and then we'll be able to measure off the wire, no problem. And um, you know, this is the difference between, I suppose you'd say theory and practice, because in theory that works, right, and it, and it should be fine. Um, and you know, we got a fabricated look. Um, by the time we had a bit of experience with it, this is what we ended up with. Right, totally different design. Uh, you can see the, the hole is in there again. Um, because we found that no matter how many you know, grub screws and, and adjusting screws we had on the LVDT, it just wouldn't sit straight on. Um, the tolerance in that little U just was nowhere near enough. And so we ended up with that as our tolerance, like 40 mil tolerance for when we could get the thing to sit on. It's nice and deep, so it's nice and stiff. So that any movement on, 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 on the, uh, the beam um, would be picked up um, by it. So, uh, we have this data taker system as well, which is um, fairly standard uh, lab equipment. Um, they're, they're not high quality, they're, they're reasonably cheap. Um, and so you know, we have a few problems with them as well. Uh, so this is what the measurements on this bridge look like. Um, if you look at the scale, uh, absolutely tiny, you know, less than 0.1 millimeters. So uh, it's, it's, it's within the realm of noise. Uh, and I'd say it was all noise, except for the fact that we can clearly see the prime movers and each axle uh, as well uh, on it um, in a lot of these cases. Sometimes you just see this. What do you do? I mean, it's it's there's just there's nonsense going on there. We don't, you know, we just we haven't been able to explain why this happens sometimes. But you know, we've got confidence, as you can see, some of those um, measurements on B4, the middle one there, make a lot of sense. And um, you know, I think there is a, a shear issue between them because I, I, if you see just there at the tip of the cursor, that was one I, I put the LVDTs back to back. Uh, and so, of course, if you're getting good load sharing between those two U-slabs, the deflection measurements should be the same between them. Um, but you can see the difference between the green and the blue, they were quite different. Um, so I think there is a, a sheer problem with this, but uh, the, the overall measurements were so small, it, it just didn't matter. Um, so this one was perfectly adequate. That's what our setup looked like uh, when it wasn't raining. <laughs> um, now we're into the urban bridges. So this is Kempton Street Bridge. And uh, now is where things are getting more interesting. Um, the other bridges are kind of small. This is a three-span um, pre-stressed concrete, continuous uh, over the, uh, the two spans, high skew, uh, and the spans are quite big, 23, 27, 25 meter spans. Uh, and so they wanted um, four mid-span measurements on each three spans, so that's 12 points measured all simultaneously, 10 hertz. Um, deflection measurements. Um, so we had uh, we, we had this beautiful drawing done by one of my students and we said perfect because you know, we're trying to figure out how much cabling we need right? and uh, so we did this drawing we said great you know we'll put, we'll put our uh, we'll put our site our, our data acquisition system over here and we'll do all these cabling runs and it'll be fine. Uh, 
it ended up being over here because as soon as we got out on site and there was a couple of Irish electricians with us as well and um, they, they, they were fantastic they just said you know I showed them this and they said well that's stupid and, um, and, and they said you wouldn't do it that way at all uh, and I just said listen to the electrician listen to the guys who do this all the time because they're going to be able to tell you a better way to do it um, as, as great as, as you might be and as many letters you have after your name uh, it doesn't matter you know that, that, so, so what they ended up doing was they did cable runs uh, this way transverse uh, across this way and then brought it all back on one on the inside face of this one beam here so instead of having this kind of cable large cable run on every beam they just had one large cable run because they they brought everything transverse uh, over to the inside face of this beam out here and then ran it all the way back to to, to our station and you know again looking at the drawings and photographs it's only until you get out there you, you can see where the best place to put your station is um, and of course this what, what it ended up doing because we had all the cables cut and labeled already we had to mirror um, our all our cables on the diagonal across this bridge uh, and so that was a bit of a, a head bender as well mm. and it, this all happened that night you know with um, site farming kind of shouting at you you know what cable am i putting in you know hurry up you're burning dollars you know um so yeah a lot of lot of stress um just a little bit more on on this system uh this tension wire system so i had kind of drawn this you know that we just epoxy bond the plate on and the lbdt would sit onto the plate and it would all be perfectly vertical and it would all sit perfectly over the tension wire and it, you know that that was just so foolish that's just not how it ended up at all um, what we did do is we bolted a, a mild steel plate um, using dynabolts just in onto the onto the face. It was a sloped face of the bridge beam, uh, and then that mild steel plate had um, some uh, uh, threaded holes in it. And then we made up uh, in our workshop. Um, we made this up so these plates to to hold the um, the LVDT in this little bracket here and. We have these screws and of course these grub screws then we can adjust to get any any kind of angle that we wanted any rotation on it and we had the the two uh sliding points as well because the screws that go into the mild steel plate that was connected to the beam can then we can adjust the height on this as much as we want as well to sit it and so we can go in and out as much as we want and we can move it up and down as much as we want uh, and then the lvdt sits in there so of course you know this was a couple of iterations in i guess before and then this was the the final solution on, on how um how this sits in so there's you know between this sketch and what actually happened there was a lot of learning on the job um, in terms of the tension wire uh think about it you've got 27 meters you know maybe uh, maybe not quite the width of this room but you know and you're trying to pull a string and have it as tight as a guitar string right and uh yeah it, it, it's just a, it, it was just a huge challenge and it, you're tr you know the thing that we're very conscious of is the thermal movements of the bridge right because through day to, to night it'll it'll undergo a huge amount of elongation and shortening so if you tighten it all up you know at night time when it's nice and cold and then the sun comes out and shines on the bridge begins to expand you're going to snap the cable so we knew we needed to put i knew i needed to put some springs in um, so here's a one of these springs uh, to try and manage the tension that's in the cable because the spring will change of course its length but it's not going to change the tension in the cable an awful lot um, so that that's the spring um, the connection onto the side of the beam then is is is, is you'll see it in the photos in a minute uh, and then there's a turnbuckle as well the idea is that you know you just pull it with your hand and then you tighten the turnbuckle and everything will be fine it doesn't the weight of the cable itself is something that cannot be held by a person uh, so it was a five mil marine grade um, high tension line. Uh, so just all these kind of problems came came out uh, in in the doing of it. Um, that's just the electrical connection. A lot of a lot of wiring, 700 meters of wiring, I think, on this bridge. Um, so here's what we kind of ended up doing um, to, to to get this tension wire system to work. The first thing is I needed to know how strong these springs were. So these we, we got them in a place called the spring shop. And it does exactly what it says on the tin. And you say to this guy, look, I need a spring, uh, you know, maybe a stiffness of three kilonewtons per meter, something like that. And he'll he he'll make them, or else he'll have them in stock. Uh, so we wanted to know the spring stiffness. So we did some testing in the lab. So now I have my load deflection curve for the spring. Um, did a few calculations on our braided um, five mil diameter cable. Um, 
you know, tested the springs to failure. So you can see the kind of extension that we get in the springs, which is a uh, fantastic, lovely ductile failure, which is definitely what we want. Um, and this is what our connection ends up looking like. So we had a, an angle bracket bolted into the side of the beam. We had um, our uh, D shackles then connecting our two springs in this case. Uh, the cable is then looped and again these little uh, D clamps um, which tighten up the cable. Um, so it goes around, it, it connects around the, um, uh, the ends of the springs there. Uh, and of course, all of these, you, you know, we're really tensioning this cable a lot. So all of these points are possible failure points. And so we got that back to the lab and uh, tested out how many of these little D clamps did we need. And because the tension that we're putting in this, I, you know, I definitely didn't want to decap decapitate anybody. So, um, so yeah, so we tested those connections and uh, discovered that really the springs were the weak point in the system, which was great. That's what we wanted to do. Um, so this is uh, what the bridge um, looks like. Um, you know, it's pretty big, and we have these EWPs, um, elevated work platforms, and. You know they're very noisy and you're driving forward and back and trying to lay out all these um, these wires and um, yeah so there's a lot going on so this is tensioning up this is um, uh, one of the side farms so we use the fence tensioner which is a thing common enough in farming it seems uh, with, with a clamp so we're, we're gripping the cable with this chain I think and then tensioning it up uh, and getting it back to the D clamp uh, and then we had the turnbuckle as well, because just trying to pull it into position in the first place was really, really tricky. Um, we did have one failure, and it went boom, and uh, fortunately, um, nobody, nobody was hurt by it. Uh, it actually was the, the D sh these little shackles, um, uh, one of them just slipped, uh, and it just hadn't been tightened enough, so um, kind of risky stuff, I guess. Um, because I knew the low deflection curve uh, from the springs, then we used the spring elongation. We just measured the spring elongation uh, to tell me what force was in the cable. Um, and I knew that from the turnbuckles that we had in the system then. As, the, as we, we tighten up the turnbuckle, I know how much I'm drawing it in, which tells me then um, what, what the force is in it. Um, and this is here on one of the, the electricians then checking the, uh, so you can see the mild steel plate. Uh, the, the kind of bracket with the grub screws um, uh, and the LVDT down and of course you can see this this thing in the picture uh, and we added a few weights on it as well just to minimize any vibrations that would be in this tension line um, so remember the beam will deflect the idea is the beam deflects uh, and the tension line stays in position uh, and then that's how we measure the deflection uh, on this I have no idea how I did that um, so this was an important bridge for us because this tension wire system wasn't um, you know, something people were familiar with. Uh, and so we wanted to validate its performance and we did it with three different methods. Um, we did it with the strain gauge approach where we, we have two strain gauges, uh, top and bottom on the beam. So we have this, this curvature estimate of deflection. Um, we did a string pot to ground. So just somewhere about here, we, had a, we just had a dynabolt, uh, an eye bolt and then just take a string right down to the ground and we measure actually that's it there it was the string pot was in here so we're measuring to an external reference uh, which is the ground because the, the the tension wire system is a relative reference it's measuring only the deflection of the beam relative to its end points but the string pot is relative to the ground so it includes all of the the bearing uh, any any movements in the bearings any movements in the bridge abutments anything like that and the last technology we use is a laser doppler vibrometer um, which is, um, yeah, it's a laser that you fire to the underside of the beam. It'd be great if we had 12 of these, but we didn't, we only had one, right? Um, they're very expensive, so. Uh, but the four system, four independent systems, all confirming each other, that gave us confidence that what we were measuring uh, was real, um, which is an important thing. So this, um, this tension wire system gives, uh, gives off some, some bizarre ratings sometimes. You just see these steps, and of course the, Vic Rhodes were getting concerned, so, oh my god, you know, we've yielded the beam, and again, the system just has these characteristics that keep emerging, and, uh, you know, I still don't know why it's doing this, and I'm going to do some lab tests uh, to try and understand it a little bit better. So we had the tension wire system, uh, we had the string pot, uh, which, is, which is, this is from the string pot, and this is from the laser Doppler vibrometer. And, you know, by comparing all of these things against each other, we kind of get a picture of confidence uh, in, in what's happening. It's not, uh, it's not pretty, um, it's not perfect, 
in, in the sense of you know it's not exactly what you'd see by your calculations but it's real you know and the real bridges behave quite differently to, to these beautiful models we have uh, so this is just a you know what it looked like um, to my PhD student Ella um, taking the measurements and you know it's cold and it's 4 a.m. and yeah so lots of Red Bull uh, so this was the first morning um, with the load then uh, uh, approaching Kempston um, Bridge and uh, we, we put down these run-on slabs as well and the approach to the bridge to try to spread the, uh, the weight and not damage the, um, the abutment or the batter at the back of it. So moving on then, the, the fifth bridge, Banksia Street Bridge. Uh, this is a really different kind of bridge, uh, it's steel uh, continuous, uh, but it's a vital bridge in the over-dimensional route network. Uh, so any heavy loads, anything that's big, needs to come through Melbourne, has to go over this bridge. And so it's a really important bridge for big roads, uh, both in terms of you know, making sure it, it, it's kept open and, and operating, uh, but also in terms of, you know, can we monitor it a different way? Can we do something, can we have a monitoring system that stays in place on this one? Um, and so we, uh, we we managed to solve that problem. I'll show you now in a minute. This is the it's a three span um, steel continuous steel girder bridge, 21, 33, 21 meters, uh, and they wanted these two side spans uh, measured and again deflections, right? Um, no matter how much we said, but strains are better. They said we want deflections, um, so we measured strains uh, and then calculated deflections. So the uh, this is, these are the, the three beams, so the, the load was to run centre of these three beams. This bridge was widened as well, but, but we stayed on, on one side on this one. Uh, and so we had a, you know, we positioned the load uh, with yellow um, paint uh, down, down um, the middle of the road. Uh, and of course the road is closed to real traffic uh, for, these, for these movements. Because it's continuous, those, uh, the link between strain and curvature um, uh, and then curvature to deflection uh, changes a little bit and um, yeah so you know we go back to our basic structural mechanics and virtual work and all the rest of it and, and we can come up with these equations and they're approximate because again they're presumed on the uh, the load being uniformly distributed uh, which again it's a you know it's a platform and it's very very long 72 meters so you know it's the approximation is probably quite good uh, but it's not perfect right um, so by measuring uh, strains at E, B and F, we can kind of see what's happening across the whole bridge because we can then take the curvatures and work out the, the deflections, uh, which is what Vic Rhodes wanted. Um, one of the challenges was we had uh, two spans and we had three girders uh, and then we needed top and bottom on each of those girders. Um, so this is, you know, we required 18, but we only had 12 of these um, to these types of gauges, these wireless nodes, uh, and so the solution was to use symmetry. Um, so the middle, the, the the beam underneath the middle of the load was the one where we put all six gauges on it. Uh, then the beam beside it, because uh, now we're saying, well, look, we think they're going to behave symmetrically. Once the load is running symmetrically, you know, the two beams are going to be the same, right? Um, well, let's leave one sensor. Or, or, let's leave one sensor over here to check that it's behaving symmetrically. Uh, and then on the beam adjacent to it, uh, we just take uh, one sensor away because by the time you've got uh, these five sensors, you know the ratio between the strains. So the strain I measure over here um, and the strain that I measure over here, if everything's linear elastic, that ratio won't change. And so by knowing those ratios from the middle beam, uh, it can tell me what the, the, the strain that I don't measure is over here. And so by using symmetries in that way, I can measure strains that I don't measure, right? Um, and it worked. Everybody was kind of happy once we explained what we were doing with this. And of course, by keeping all our real gauges on the, on, on the most heavily loaded beam, you know, everybody was kind of happy with that as well. So, um, so this is the system. It's a wireless uh, remote monitoring system. Um, what's really cool about them, um, these are your standard kind of steel foil uh, strain gauges, but they connect into this plate which then talks to a wireless node transmitter, which transmits uh, the strain signals to a gateway which we put adjacent to the bridge, uh, and then the gateway um, reports it all back to a server in the US, and then just with some software um, we can then log in and see it in real time, uh, and we can change the sampling rate up to about 40 hertz. Uh, a second and then we turn it back down again. The, these wireless nodes have a battery in them and um, they have a lot of programming in them 
to minimize the power draw on the battery. So they reckon you get a 10 year life out of these wireless nodes, um, which, which is really good. Um, and each node is, is probably about, cost about 900 euros, something like that. Um, so it's a great way, it's a great solution actually. So we're rolling on the project I mentioned earlier, next month we're going to roll these out on six bridges um, because you know it's, it's, it enables the, the road authority to have long-term monitoring, to be collecting all this data under real traffic, have a look at how the bridge is behaving under thermal uh, movements as well. Um, so it's a great solution and we were able to roll it out on this one bridge. Uh, we had enough time to get it in uh, for this one bridge. Um, so this is my PhD student um, Ella again, uh, she was up uh, in this uh, cherry picker and then uh, this was a particular, it was really difficult, um, there was only one guy uh, who could drive it properly uh, through to get it through the basket through the, the gap uh, and then to get it projected out uh, to the centre uh, and up uh, to the top flange, right, because that's where she needed to put the gauges on. Um, the scaffolding and propping that you see here is because there was a concern about the shear capacity of these crossheads uh, and so they propped it uh, to reduce the, the problem with shear in these crossheads. Uh, the, the raw strains then that we measure, um, you know, kind of have these shapes to it but then we convert them to the deflections uh, as the load moves over uh, and so we begin to see um, what we expect to see, which is, um, you know, symmetry. Uh, this one is probably quite a bit easier to see. Uh, so the middle beam, of course, is undergoing much more deflection, and the other two beams then uh, have the same deflection profile. So the load is moving along the line it's supposed to move. So when we had all this done, then of course they're able to look at the maximum deflections and say, yeah, they're acceptable. They're within the range that we want. And by monitoring the 20 movements, um, we're we're trying to see consistency in those deflections over time. Uh, and we did, they were consistent and that means we're not ratcheting, we're not um, yielding the bridge. Uh, so this is kind of what it looks like, got them to pose with our, we got our, our high vis made up uh, and the Yarra is the main river in Melbourne as well, so yeah, it's kind of, it's a nice shot. The last bridge then is uh, Middleborough Road Bridge. This is a really important bridge, it's over the Eastern Freeway which is, it's like the M50 um, around Melbourne, um, so it's a very, very busy motorway and uh, you know again uh, th that drove a lot of the solutions a lot of the problems that we faced um, the load was coming down the motorway but then had to come up the slip road which is a, an, a, you know an off ramp because it's an overbridge uh, and so it's got a quite a hill to come up uh, and it has to make this 90 degree corner uh, to, to proceed on this way and so the load is, is coming quite fast and, uh, and it doesn't want to stop right because it's it's really really heavy um, so that was keeping the load online for where we needed it for uh, this bridge was was a challenge. Um, the monitoring points that uh, the client that Vic Roads wanted um, were like this. You see, the shape of the uh, the pier is is really terrible in terms of having an eccentric large load, and so some static monitoring was also done by the surveyors uh, of with these points to make sure that the whole thing wasn't uh, tilting um, fortunately we weren't charged with that which was great we only had to monitor the the beams um, and so the these were the the four beams that they stipulated on two spans uh, to be monitored 33 meter spans so the tension wire system that you saw that caused a lot of problems on 27 meters it scaled up again, 33 meters um, for our tension wire system. Um, the problems with, with this bridge were really the traffic management. Because this motorway is so busy, we, uh, and, and being anywhere near live traffic, uh, the health and safety rules around what you can do and um, how close you can be and what speed the traffic has to be, they were very, very stringent and that's as it should be. Um, as a result of the, the traffic rules around it, it takes about an hour to set the traffic up because of the way the guys have to let, set the cones down, change the speed limits down um, before the site's safe to, to work on. Um, it takes about an hour for them to take it down as well and you have possession of the road um, from about 8pm through until about 5am. Right? So you lose an hour, now it's 9pm before you've started anything uh, and also at 4am you have to get off. Right? And it, it's just, it makes everything so intense um, and of course you know it's the time of night it is, it's, it's, um, it was a real problem. Um, 
So if you think of the Tangimar system I mentioned and all the wiring, the electrical wiring that goes along with those sensors, um, we were trying to pull it from this side across the pier, across the full width of the other side over to our data collection point over here. And uh, the problems that we faced with that were, how do you have a tension wire that's only halfway across? Well, it can't, you know, it can't be tense. So we had to coil stuff up uh, at mid-span, you know, after one night's work, safely coil it up as best we could, and then come back the following night and try and get it across. So the first night we would take these two lanes, the, the inside two lanes, or the slower lanes, um, and we do our work in there. We'd get our wires as far across as we could reach safely with our EWPs, coil them up, and then leave them for the day. The next night we'd come back and we'd take possession of the outside lanes, the fast lanes. And then we'd collect up our coils, bring them across to the pier head, and then leave them there. And then the next night we'd come back and we'd take you know, the lanes on the other carriageway and begin carrying them across. And that sequence, that logistics of work, um, was a real problem for actually trying to get the work done in itself and because uh, the system the tension or tensioning the system didn't work so well uh, against that kind of um, traffic management uh, problems that we had um, and then of course we had some problems because somebody gave me the wrong calibration factors and the first night you know we're, we're looking at the baseline and um, you know this thing is telling me it's moving you know 300 millimeters or something I'm saying that can't be right you know I can see it's not moving 300 mil so the calibration factor for the sensor got mixed up with something else and so how do we check it well um, this was a really stressful night because of course uh, I thought we were going to delay the whole project, which I did not want to be responsible for. So I'm on the phone uh, to my uh, PhD student, and she's up over the far side of the carriageway. I have the ear defenders on because I, you know, it's really noisy, and people are incredibly ignorant to workers on motorways at night, revving their engines when they're under the bridge, you know, screaming abuse, and because we've we've caused a traffic jam, right? And it just adds to the aura of stress, you know. So I've uh, got the ear defenders on, I'm on the phone to her, I'm saying um, with my vernier scales, I'm, I'm measuring, I, I'm imposing, you know, maybe a 10 mil deflection. Um, what are you reading up, back up there at, at the data acquisition system? And she say, oh, 75 mil, you know, okay, well, that's not right. Uh, and so we had to do a kind of a live calibration uh, to determine a calibration factor um, in, in this situation. So, you know, I, I guess, um, yeah, mistakes can be made, and, and it's just it's about having some redundancy in your systems to make sure you're able to get in there and, and correct them if, if you need to. Um, again, we, we, we with the measurements on this one, we saw this kind of stickiness um, of the tension wire system. It just seems to refuse to return to zero in certain instances. Um, I think it's more to do with the LVDTs um, than the tension wire itself. The red ones here are string pots. And so when we had string pops in, we kind of get a nice return to zero. So the tension wire system is, is neat. Um, I think our LVDTs are sticky. Um, so that's to be explored a little bit, but they're the kind of readings we were getting. One of the issues we had, this was an urban bridge. We came along one night with about 10 minutes before the Lotus queue, somebody had cut the cables. And they'd cut four of our cables from the far span, because we had them, you know, four cables from one span, four cables from the other span. And then we just connect them up to the DAQ. Uh, each night, and they cut four of the cables. Uh, and at this point, then we said, you know, bugger, <laughs> what are we going to do? So we called the cables A, B, C, D, and we took the readings, right? we connected it up real quick, took the readings, and then we went through a logic table to try and work out which reading should be which based on what kind of measurements we had observed previously when we had the, the known situation. Um, we got it to work. The point is, if you're going to label cables, don't just label them at the end because as soon as somebody cuts one meter inside that cable, you don't know what the cable means. So now on more jobs that I've done since, we put labels periodic along the length of the cable. And that way we'll definitely be able to, to verify. Uh, and why couldn't we just go to the sensor and trace it all the way back? Well, because we need to, we'd have to close the road to do that and it's a motorway and you know, huge expense in traffic management to do that. So, um, so we, we were able to, to, to sort that out. As the load crosses down, we're trying to make sure it's on, it's it's over the beams we want it over, and so on. Um, so that was always a bit of a challenge because uh, the guys just wanted to get it done. And this was our um, data acquisition station, a bit of GoPro, and that's um, the principal bridge engineer for Vic Roads, 
um, you know, standing there making sure we're doing it all right and we're meeting his specifications and so on. So, um, yeah, great, great having your client there looking over your shoulder as you do your work. Um, so, look, the conclusions on this were um, uh, what was great were the, the three parties that were involved in this Monash University, um, you know, me and my team, Vic Roads, which were the statutory authority on this. Uh, and John Holland, where the contractor working for the Level Crossing Removal Authority who were charged with, with, with doing this. The way it worked was John Holland simply said to us, get it done. That was it. They didn't care how we got it done, how we satisfied the client's uh, demands. They just said, get it done. And in turn, Vic Rhodes would say to us, what should we do? How are we going to keep these bridges safe? And you know, that kind of three-way conversation made the project a success. It meant we could do it. Had anybody stuck to, uh, let's say, their more formal roles, and, and you know, if, the st if, if Vic Rose just said, no, you have to do it our way, and there's no conversation about it, it wouldn't have been a success. Because you see, we measured strains a lot more than just measuring deflections. Uh, and I, I think, you know, for a project like this, uh, all the people need to be really open to that kind of, um, let's just, let's just make the project a success and let's not get stuck in our individual roles here. And by doing that, um, it was a success. John Holland were fantastic because the, uh, for example, the, the fact that I, you know, somebody messed up one of those calibration factors and I, I needed to get under the bridge again, and that's 15 grand, like right there, to get back under that bridge, to get up with the verniers to, to get that. And they just said, yeah, no problem, just get it done, you know? Um, so I think, you know, that's one of the key to success uh, on this project. And, you know, we have a big team of people that, um, that took part in it. Um, so just to finish, um, you know, the engineering is great, but look, what, what I love is seeing the impact that these things have on, uh, I guess, for, for Victorians, for the public. Authorised by Victorian Government, One Treasury Place, Melbourne. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, my name is Paul Sexton. I'm, uh, I'm standing in for Kieran Mann, who, who couldn't be here tonight, who's the regional group chair. So I want to um, apologise on, on his behalf and also say thanks to Henry, who, um, who gave the intro um, in, my, in my absence. So I have a few questions myself, so I'm going to open it to the floor for anyone who wants to um, contribute to those questions. You guys obviously did the movement on our monitoring, but somebody must have checked from the start strength points that the bridges were capable of supporting the load. Is that anything from your side or did somebody else do that? No, we didn't do that. Um, they were checked by consultants, uh, but the strength side is, is, is yeah, right, check the strengths, but they're checking it ultimately. Um, uh, that's not the situation if you're concerned with uh, damage. So it, it, it's making sure that you're not getting yield uh, in the bridge. Because if you begin to get yield, um, you've you, you, you got to replace the bridge, right? Um, and so yeah, collapse wasn't a concern, but it, it, was, it, was, it was making sure things were within serviceability limits. Yeah. Um, the consultant reports, I never saw them actually. Um, on, on subsequent projects, on a project just finished for wind turbine moves, um, they did give me the consultant report, so I had much more information to go on. Here it was simply go out there, monitor, and tell us what the deflections are. It was, it was, uh, yeah. And the, the, your clients seem to be very, I suppose, informed in that you weren't just blindly saying, go and check it, or maybe it were, but they, they seem to tell you where to put the monitoring, exactly what you want on each bridge, they seem to understand what you're telling them back without 
from what you said. Right? Yeah. And so that is something there obviously that you know. Well, well, well uh, you, you know, you're absolutely right, and this is why it was a success. N not because, you know, we were great, um, uh, or the crowds were great, but it was because we all just worked together. They were open to what we were telling them back, you know, they were saying, they could have been, some statutory authorities might be like this, you know, we set deflections and you're measuring strains and that will not do, right? But they weren't like that. They said, okay, why are you measuring strains? demonstrate to us how you doing this is meeting um, the principles of what we're trying to achieve here. And by, ha by them being open to that and by us being able to explain and everybody coming to an agreement, it meant that the project could, could go ahead and, and get up, you know. And um, every, everybody, everybody was, had skin in the game with this uh, because uh, if Vic Roads uh, were seen to be holding things up politically, that wouldn't be tenable, right? Because this government was very, um, it, it, it had sold its next election on getting this stuff done. And, uh, you know, money wasn't really a problem here. It was, it was just get it done. And so everybody was in it, everybody was in it to make the success. And that's why it worked. that you went with the option, uh, it's a little bit different than the structure, it's about the choice of doing something the problem there but the cross rails. Why did you not go with the tunnel? Why did you go with the bridge there instead of the uh, I think the bridge, the bridge um, yeah it's a good, uh, I wasn't involved in that, but, but the, uh, the, there is quite a few of the, the removed <coughs> level crossings. Um, uh, do go under, but the, the geotech and the soil works is actually a lot more complex than just building a bridge. So I think that's why they preferred the bridge because, again, from start to end, it was only a 60 day possession of the rail line, which I, I'm, I don't know how they do that, but you know, obviously having precast beams is part of it. Um, but I just think that that's so short, uh, I don't think there's any way that uh, they could do the, uh, the cut uh, in 60 days you know, soil st stabilization and everything like that. I just don't, I don't think that could be done in, in such a, so a short uh, possession of time frame. So it wasn't the money or it just was the time frame? You know? Time frame, time, yeah. And, and again, this is because the government had committed to removing, I think they said, there's 54 level crossings, they said in our first four years in government in, in the state, we're gonna remove 24, I think, and then they said in the following, four-year term, if we're re-elected, we will remove 30. And, and, you know, they didn't fudge around the numbers. They, they said exactly what they wanted to achieve. In the end, um, because of the way it was packaged up in, in uh, kind of PPP uh, approach to the, to the contracts, I think in, in the first four years, because they were re-elected, right? Uh, in the first four-year term, uh, they got 27 or 28 level crossings done. But it was just, you know, it, it, money wasn't the problem, it was time. Yeah, and, and that worked for us, you know, because it meant anything I needed, I got, uh, without argument, which was great. <laughs> we just have one another question there, Ron. Yeah, and just you mentioned at the start that the solutions you came up with might not have been the best solutions because of the short time frame and the rest. I mean, was there any retrospect and you gone back and seen what would have been a better solution on, on some of the to tonight? Yeah, better data acquisition systems. Uh, I don't like the this data taker. I don't know if you have them here, but it's uh, Thermo Fisher supply them, and it, it was an Australian brand that was bought over, and so Australia uses them a lot. But I'm, I'm not. I'm now kind of not sold on them. Um, I guess somebody from their product team would say you're not using them right. But uh, I've used other systems and not had the same problems that I've discovered with those. So I'd use a different DAQ. Uh, the tension wire system, I would like to get in the lab first and you know, be able to, to know exactly what tension I need in it and you know, really kind of engineer that a lot better. Um, it wasn't so much uh, designed as empirically engineered on site you know, until it was beginning to work for us. Um, but it does work, which is, which is kind of neat. Um, uh, what else? Um, I'd probably, you know, I wouldn't be measuring deflections. Measuring deflections directly is, is not a great approach. If, you, if you're really interested in the health of the structure, I think you want to be putting strain gauges, accelerometers uh, around the place because uh, they're much more sensitive to what's going on with the bridge. Um, 
Uh, and yeah, uh, I'd probably just have a lot more sensors than the ones we had uh, as well. Yeah, that's a good question. Was there any consideration given to the, the influence of the moving load with respect to uh, the excitation in the bridge? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, yes, there was, in the sense that we didn't want any influence from a moving load. So uh, when it came to the bridges, they were limited to um, crawl speed to uh, 10 kilometers an hour. And the, somewhere in the code, buried deep, it says you can remove dynamic amplification factor uh, if, if, the, if, if you're going at 10k an hour. The truth of it was they, you know, they were a lot faster than 10k in, in a lot of situations. Especially, you saw in the video, um, it, it coming up the off-ramp to get around the corner. And, and, you know, it was just going as fast as it could to get up the ramp. Uh, because I mentioned before that the two tractors weren't sufficient and, and that was on, on a hill uh, on the first night and so that's why it ended up with five tractors, you know, uh, to, to, to get it. Um, so whilst, yeah, on paper it was 10k, I think quite a bit it wasn't, um, yeah. But it, it, it was still slow enough that we didn't have a lot of dynamics happening. Okay. There's that fear of breaking and moving load. Uh, yeah, well, braking is a longitudinal load on the bridge deck. Um, nobody really raised that as a as a worry. Um, I think because the load wasn't going to stop. Was that, that what speed was the was was the, the train going at like that? The load? Uh, so if if it was on the Hume Highway coming down, so there was a big gap on, on between our bridges, and in, in that gap, it was on the Hume Highway and. Uh, I think it was doing 50 or 60 kilometers an hour um, on that, but then when it came through uh, our roads and so on, it was going a lot slower. It was, you know, must have been 20. So when it was, when it was um, heading up the off ramp, yeah. how, how fast was that going? Well, it, it probably ended up only being about 15 or 20k at the, at the, at the top of the off ramp, but um, I mean, it's, it's scary, you know, this thing is really charging at you, you know, and it's getting a bit slower and slower as it's coming up to you. Um, yeah, but it, it was definitely slow enough that we weren't worried about down the amplification. Yeah. You uh, automated an awful lot of the suspension amplification um, using a couple of sensors that were set up measuring from the ground. Yeah. But was there any more in depth monitoring done of the bottoms themselves? For a lot, the likes of the smaller bridge, for example, was supposed to the bottom. No, is the answer. Um, no, there wasn't. Um, what was interesting about the string pot measurement was because it was to the ground, an external reference, we, we measured a lot more movement in the string pot than we did deflection in the beam, even though it was to the same point. And that extra movement was compression of the bearing, which is an elastomeric bearing. Uh, you know, uh, I guess. Um, slight settlement, not, not you, you know, just elastic settlement of the, the piles and the abutment wall and all those other movements of the bridges were captured in the string pot measurement to the external reference. Uh, and so, you know, I expected that to be a bigger measure and it was and that alone gives you confidence that the numbers you're reading then through your different systems are, are consistent with each other with what you expect. Yeah. Um, so definitely the bearings and everything were moving as well, but they just, they, they weren't really concerned for them. And, and I'd agree with you if I didn't have other independent measurements mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why I'm confident that those non-returns to zero um, were actually in the linear potentiometers themselves. I, I just think that they maybe didn't like being out of, out of the laboratory very much um, and I would change them to, to answer the other question. Uh, because on Middleware Road, when we, we put in, again, you know, I, I was getting everything from the lab and people are saying, oh, I'm using that in my experiments, and I said, I don't care, I need it for my job, you know. Um, but I didn't get enough, and, and I needed two string pots on Middleware Road Bridge, and um, I think the picture where I'm using the vernier, that's actually a string pot. And, um, I'm going to go back to it, can't I? Uh, yeah, so you see the little blue thing. Um, that, that's the, the barrel of the string pot uh, here. And those string pots, 
gave nice return to zero, right? So why is it they're giving a nice return to zero and the other things aren't? So that's why I'm kind of confident. It's not the data acquisition system. It's not the tension wire system in and of itself. Um, it, it, it's, it's probably the, the linear potentiometers that uh, were just sticky. Just, you, you know, I mean, you, you look at this thing here and, um, you know, we, we greased them, we, we put WD-40 in them, you know, we checked them in our fingers, but, but I think just they're probably not the best sensor to have been using, I'd say. Yeah, the question is, you the start of like the layout of the truck and the load, but uh, do you have any idea what the axle loads are again, or do you have the solution from the driver? Uh, so the axle loads, I think, were, uh, we can go back to it, I think they were 14 tons, um, because they don't like uh, anything um, beyond 15, where has it gone? Yeah. Um, so there we, oh no, 16 tons, yeah, they don't like anything beyond 15. Uh, tons more to do with um, I think pavement damage um, because of this fourth power loss. So there are 16 tons. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there's a question on the um, that question. No, and look, that that's the yeah, um, and, and no, I wasn't involved in the other end. And the other end was just left to the state road authority to, to do it themselves. Um, sometimes I think they were using span over 250. Other times I think they had a grillage model that they were comparing off. Um, you know, we didn't have to be doing. I, I just every day we have to give. Um, it's, it's in the video there. Every we have to provide a report on the previous night's measurements by 12 noon the next day in order for them to issue the permit for the move that night. Uh, and they needed to be confident that. Um, they, they weren't seeing this, this ratcheting, this damage um, accumulating as these moves uh, progressed. Because of the, the you, you know, just the, not so much about um, the, the bridges, but, but it, it's, it's closing those bridges would have such a huge effect on disruption, traffic disruption, economic disruption, it just wouldn't be tenable for them to, to allow damage into those bridges. Um, so I provided a report to them by noon and uh, you know, usually by 4 p.m. they issued the permit, so whatever went on in there, you know, they were happy with it. Um, yeah, I wasn't involved in that, in that end of the Quick one. Uh, was it hard to control the speed of the thing that if you fly with the trucks? Uh, how did they get the speed up to slow down? All I had was a torch. <laughs> <laughs> and on. Um, I mentioned the center line running because most of these bridges and mo these guys, this is what they do, right? They're not these beams, other heavy loads. This is what they do. They're heavy haulers. And they are so familiar with center line running on bridges that if you tell them to not run on the center line, their head explodes, right? They don't know what to do. And on the first bridge, on Kilmore Bridge, I emphasized that it was off center. And to this, to them, it doesn't make sense. Why would it be off center? But of course, you, as an engineer, you look at that cross section and say, oh my God, you don't want it straddling that joint, which we don't know what's going on in there. Uh, and so it had to be off center. So there was one night, you know, I see the thing coming. I think they had just changed over driver or something like that. He, he just assumed it was center line running or the TSS, the traffic police um, were saying center line running. I had to jump out with the torch and start, you, you, you know, slow down and, you know, uh, uh, come over this way on, 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 on the bridge. Um, so that was about the only control and the speed of the thing. I had. But they knew the bridge was coming up. Um, so they, they were slowing down to remove that dynamic amplification for, for us. So, um, but yeah, being, um, so since then I've been being involved in three more projects like this um, and I have a CD radio now and I can talk to them and that's much better than jumping out with the torch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we'll take one, that, one last question then. Yeah, yeah, the cross section of one of the bridge piers and the loads come over on one side. Yeah. It's very centricic. I don't think you were monitoring that uh, I didn't, but but I know they were happy with it. It's probably on a bit too far for me to scroll, but um, I know they were happy with it. Um, uh, but it, it, it really was stark, wasn't it? The shape of that uh, pier um, in the Midlands Banks here um, is, um, yeah, it's it's just horrible for an eccentric load, isn't it? I mean. 
But I think the pile cap extends the, the full width, of the, you know, nearly the full width of the bridge underneath it, because uh, obviously I've trimmed the drawing there, but the pile cap was on the drawing. Um, so it's a huge bending moment, and I guess, um, you, you know, they'd be worried about cracking up there and everything, but it was checked by consultants, and I wasn't involved in it, you know. Um, yeah. But it, it's hard when you look at that, and you're like, wow, you know. But we couldn't run it down the middle because it had, um, it had a, I think it had an Aramco barrier and a, a, a curb and um, a pavement on it. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll, we'll wrap up on that. Just leave it for me to, to uh, give a vote of thanks to Colin and, and tell him um, I love lectures like this, first of all, for two, two reasons. Really, one that it's, it just proves again that we live in a global village and everything in different, anywhere around the world, it's kind of the same thing, um, but different using some different tools and um, but the engineering, you know, the logic is all, is all the same, the approach is is, um, is the same. So um, that's great. And then it's about bridges, so that's I got into structural engineering because of because of, uh, of, of bridges and um, I do still um, um, miss them dearly. The other thing I'd say is uh, short design, you mentioned short uh, design and um, time frame that you have to ramp up on this. And I always think that uh, sometimes the short design frame is good when you have to think of, of new stuff to do. Because what you do is it's a bit like, I think, uh, triage on the, on the battlefield or something like that. You have to make it simple, keep it yeah. simple, and you don't go down too many rabbit holes. If you have a very long time frame, you end up going down those rabbit holes and doing a lot of stuff that maybe in hindsight you didn't re really, really need to, yeah. to do. I just asked one question. And uh, was there any damage at all along the roof before and to any of the bridges? The, um, the spandrel wall uh, on the, the arch bridge yeah. incurred some uh, moved some separation of the spandrel wall from the from the ring of the arch uh, and it pushed out by I think about 20 cent 20 millimeters. Well, um, without the very bridge that happened. they could have actually put some balls work in and reinforced that pretty easy. Yeah. Um, is that something they might do? do this replace? No, anyway, it was a heritage bridge, yeah. so that, that was the, the, okay. the concern about that, yeah.